termite. And of course, that's directly Hitlerian. Hitler, and, and he, uh, oh, do you know what Farrakhan did in his gesture and he said of peacemaking with the Jewish people? He's a pretty good musician. He played the Mendelssohn violin concerto. And only a Nazi would think Mendelssohn is Jewish. He was baptized Christian. And yes, he was the grandson of Moses Mendelssohn. But in any event, um, I, I, I think the left is more dangerous because there is more international support. And, and by the way, uh, many of these left-wing regimes are also profoundly anti-Semitic. The Maduro regime in Venezuela, which is one of the nightmare regimes in the world, is profoundly anti-Semitic. And all around the world, it is a uh, it is a a danger. I think a danger primarily from the organized left. Now, Michael, you took some heat, and you were one of the courageous conservatives who uh, was honest. You kept your integrity, and you called balls and strikes with Donald Trump. And here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. But we live in a very polarized world, and you were you and Ben Shapiro and Jonah Goldberg. You were in that genre of conservatives who just told it like it is, and Crothammer, the late Crothammer. And then, you know, our good friend Dennis Prager sort of, you know, went all in. Um, tell us about how you reconcile somebody who gives us something incredible, like moving the embassy to Jerusalem, reaffirming the connection with this city that's been ours for 3,000 years. So how do you reconcile a horrible character flaw undermining true conservative principles and so forth with a positive outcome. Is there, how do you do that? Um, I think every, every human being, every president is a work in progress. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the problems in my life is I'm not willing to prejudge President Trump. I think he's done a lot of beautiful things. I do. I, I think his appointments to our courts almost without exception, these are outstanding people, outstanding people. And Brett Kavanaugh, I happen to know, I mean, I, 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 one of my friends from law school is a very prominent Democrat who knows Brett Kavanaugh socially. He says he's a huge philo Semite. He's a big supporter of Israel. And, and not that that's the only thing that matters in the Supreme Court, he's a man of fine character. And so is Neil Gorsuch. And uh, so was Nikki Haley, who President Trump brought to the UN. He uh, thought Mashiach was going to be a man, and who knew? <laughs> no, no, but, but at the same time, you see, this is the problem. I don't fit in, really, in this world, because basically in the media, uh, if you turn on, turn on MSNBC, uh, and if Trump cures cancer, he will be attacked for taking work away from doctors. <laughs> and if you tune in most of talk radio, including most of the stations I'm on, if Trump starts World War III and there are millions who die, well, you don't understand. He, he has a long game. He's playing the long game. This is what he does, because he's a master negotiator. Look, uh, I, uh, uh, Trump is a work in progress. And today, I think, it was a good day for President Trump. But yesterday, I thought it was a horrible day for President Trump. And again, I feel it's my job to try to approach each day anew and to watch the way this thing unfolds. I, I, I should say to people, I'm sure many of you know, I, uh, to my regret, I'm not going to be on AM870 um, after the 1st of January. And no, I'm not. Uh, and not much worry, you can still hear. Yeah, but the show is continuing, and we're continuing in a bunch of other stations. And uh, we are also doing a. We're going to be doing a commercial-free version of the show that is available. Go to michaelmedved.com. Sign up to be a medhead. The first month subscription is 99 cents, and. Uh, and please do, because again, we, I want to continue this show, despite the fact that I was unwilling to commit in advance uh, to support President Trump for re-election. Because I don't know. I, I just don't know. And we'll see. Now, Michael, you've worn like a whole bunch of hats in your life, right? You, were, uh, you went to Yale Law School, and then you decided to become a, a speechwriter. You worked in 
politics, you were a consultant, you wrote a, a bestseller based on Time Magazine. They picked like 35 graduates from Palisades High School right here in LA. It's a famous story. And then Michael just researched them. And whatever happened to the class of 65, it became a big bestseller. And then you got into culture, you became a famous movie critic, and you did that for years, and then you, you did it in writing, you did it on television, and then you became head of a synagogue on the beach, and then you did a TV show and a radio show. Out of all these hats, is there one that you say, well, that's the one I sort of love the most? Uh, like movie critic, for example? Not that Not one. Not that one? No. Tell well, us which, which hat that you really feel is you? Probably this one. <laughs> uh, Amen. You know, it's, uh, my, my wife teases me about it. Um, and I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why I say that. Because um, Pacific Jewish Center, which is still going strong, and I still stay in touch with a lot of our, our friends who are there, and um, I think that uh, the new rabbi there, Shalom Rabbanowitz, is doing an outstanding job, from what I understand. And there, and that that enterprise began in my living room, and uh, that's really important to me. Um, there is a day school that here in town that has gone through various permutations, which I started together with Rabbi Daniel Lappin. And uh, it's now uh, Yeshiva Or Eliyahu. Now it's gone, it's moved around, it's different leadership, but still it's an institution. And uh, where I live now, I've been for um, 22 years now, a very active member. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really a very active member in uh, Island Synagogue in Mercer Island, Washington. And I was instrumental in, in uh, getting our new synagogue building, which is on three acres of land, and it's really, really a beautiful synagogue building that we had to do very little. It's a former Christian Science Church. It's a long story. And uh, so that stuff matters to me. And, and then second, uh, writing books. Since I was a little kid, I wrote my first book when I was in eighth grade. You know, I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and then I wrote a book in high school, and then I wrote a book for senior, my senior project at Yale was a novel, and, uh, and I have uh, an absolute use. I never talk about this. This is something, this is, will stump your friends with Michael Mendez trivia. I have a master's degree in creative writing, which together with $2.50 can buy you a Starbucks. Um, not anymore. In any, not anymore, right? Uh, <laughs> So no, but, but books, having, uh, having 13 books to put on the shelf, and of course the most important hat is being husband and father, but, but I'm sure you'd say the same. Well, who would like to see uh, Michael Moore in the Jewish Journal? <laughs> <laughs> everything I've seen in your writing, and I've been reading you for years, you wrote a piece for Olam magazine that you may not remember. And I don't know, it really moved us. That's Shabbat, right? right? It was a piece on Baal Chubas. Right. On Baal Chubas. <laughs> and he did a whole different take. And the take was, when you find God, you become religious, you put on tefillin, you're madly in love with this new thing. I own the truth. This is the truth from Sinai. It turns out your parents are not exactly kosher, and you have these conflicts. And Michael wrote this incredible tape, like, don't get too smug. Remember where you come from. You were eating bacon two years ago. <laughs> don't get too cocky now. I'm so uh, from part, part, Do you remember that piece? I very much do, because it was, it was largely based on uh, what another great lover of the Jewish people said, Mark Twain. He said, when I was uh, 17, uh, I knew that my father was a complete idiot. Uh, when I was 27, I was amazed at how much the old man had learned in just 10 years. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this was my own experience. 
I went in the course of about six weeks uh, from thinking that my parents were old-fashioned and uh, too traditionalist and constricting and they weren't modern. And then a, a few weeks later, I, after I started making my first sort of steps to being uh, observant at all, and then all of a sudden my parents, oh, they were assimilationist, they were so compromising, they, they weren't authentic Jews. And this happens with too many Bali Chuba, but here, here's the basic point. I, you will find sometimes among people who are new to Judaism, and, and you'll ask them, well, what, what were your parents? Oh, they were nothing. Now it turns out, if you ask a little deeper, he was a president of the conservative shul, right? I mean, and in other words, I, I think that we have a real problem, and it's a problem of gaiva, it's a problem of arrogance, which is, is difficult which is to, in a way, boost our own religious <coughs> credentials and status by minimizing uh, the religious commitments of our parents. And by the way, and I say this, uh, my, my parents, my, my, my mom, we kept kosher till I was six, and then she got in a fight with kosher butcher, <laughs> and then we didn't eat kosher, ne never when I was growing up, even when I was very young did my parents keep Shabbat. But my mother lit candles every Friday night. God bless her. My father came home from work. He said Kiddush. Uh, they were always members of the shul. They always made sure we went to Hebrew school. They were in the top percent of, of American Jews, really non-Orthodox Jews, because they weren't Orthodox. And, uh, and again, and I think it's because of that that all of my brothers, all, all three of my brothers have become religiously involved. Uh, two of my brothers, uh, I'll name, you know, my brother Harry and my brother Jonathan, who's famous uh, because he's an Israeli entrepreneur, uh, really seriously religious. And their kids are religious. And, uh, but that's partially because of where my parents started as a home. And my father, of course, uh, before he moved to Israel, the last 25 years of my dad's life, he was an amazing mind. He used to love to lane. He had never lane. He didn't lane for his bar mitzvah. But he he lane for the first time when he was 53 years old. And he was an excellent Balkhore. And the Shabbat before he died, um, we came out for his 83rd birthday. And uh, my, my brother Harry, who lives here in California, and me, so that we could hear my dad laying his entire parsha in Yerushalayim, and uh, and and the next next week he was gone. Well, so <coughs> Michael, I'm a film nut. How many movies have you seen in your life? Take a guess. <laughs> Three thousand. I mean, I've seen too many this year, and way too many in my life. No, it's it's many. Four thousand, five thousand. Okay. So when when I was chief film critic for the New York Post. That was that was about um, that was over three hundred movies a year. Right. So three hundred movies a year, and that was five years of that. So that's fifteen hundred movies, and then sneak pre It's it's a lot of movies. So it's, I'm going to ask. It's at least really, a year. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a totally unfair question because I'm going to fill out and have an answer. What's your favorite movie? Do you have one? I do, and I usually, depending on the crowd, I will give one or two answers. So I'll give them both here, because this is, you know, split down the middle. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington with the great Jimmy Stewart. Uh, this time of year, everybody, certainly everybody who's Christian, watches It's a Wonderful Life, but I don't think you have to be Christian to love that movie. Uh, Frank Kappler directed It's a Wonderful Life. He directed Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It's an amazingly patriotic movie, and it portrays some of the timeless conflicts in politics and shows why politics really and the American government is a miracle and can be heroic. Plus it's a wonderful romance. Uh, plus it's just so splendidly acted and it was in a miracle year for Hollywood. 1939, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington came out, same year as Long of the Wind, same year as Wizard of Oz, same year as Wuthering Heights. Okay, 1942. Uh, right after that was another movie that I just love, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, um, with Peggy Ann Garner and Dorothy McGuire 
and uh, John Philip Dunn, and it's a story of an immigrant family. Uh, he's an Irish singing waiter. The mother takes in washing. They have a little daughter living in the tenements in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. <laughs> and she wants to be a writer. And her father is a horrible drunk. And yet she thinks he's the most wonderful man in the world. And it always makes me cry. Uh, because it's a father-daughter movie. And, you know, we, I've been blessed with the world's two most wonderful daughters. And oh, well, I've got four of them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something special there about father-daughter. People, people understand father-son, but the father-daughter thing, the tree grows in Brooklyn, and if you haven't seen it, many of you haven't. It's Ely Kazan's first movie, it's in black and white. It is absolutely gorgeous, and he does something in that film that's masterful. I know I'm going on too long. But um, what he does is it's all ambient music. It has a very rich soundtrack, but it's the music you hear on the street of a hurdy-gurdy, or somebody singing, or someone playing the piano on the window across the street, and it's magical. Now, um, have you seen anything in the last few years in modern Hollywood that captures some of that that you 